Alan Eatry, and I'm honored to say that I am the president of the New Jersey Tea Party Caucus. And on behalf of the New Jersey Tea Party Caucus and our sponsor, Smart Girl Politics and New Jersey Tea Parties United, I would like to welcome all of you to this very unique event where we will begin to ask the tough questions about education and we're hoping to discover the real problems so then we can move on to solving the issues before us. Before we begin this program, please stand as Dr. Al Freck, who is also a committee chairman for this event, leads us as we pledge our allegiance to this great country. And I'd also like to have uh, Joan Brennan O'Neill, who will lead us in, well, actually, she will sing the Star Spangled Banner. Tea 
party uh, alliance, and uh, he is, he was very instrumental. He and Anthony, Anthony, would you please stand as well? In the finding the location for us and seeing everything through. And we have Michelle Tal uh, Talamo. Uh, Michelle is of the uh, New Jersey Tea Party Coalition in Bergen County. And uh, let's see, who else? Al Freck, I don't see him, Dr. Al Freck, who was the chairman of the event committee for this. So I want to especially thank them for contributing to this event and all the time and work they put in. So, let's see. Next we have, um, I'd like to introduce Senator Dick LaRosa. Dick, would you please stand? Bob Babin, and uh, we want to extend a special thank you to Dick LaRosa, who is presently the President and CEO of Solutions for New Jersey, and who is instrumental in bringing some of the talent we have here today. Next, Rosalie Anetti. Rosalie is doing so much for us here today. She is one of our panelists. She's the state representative for Smart Girl Politics and she is co-chairman of our Education Reform Committee as well. And of course, we'd like to thank uh, Smart Girl Politics and New Jersey Tea Parties United who co-sponsored this event. I believe Stacy Mott is here. Stacy, uh, I don't see her, she might be out in the corridor, but she is the founder of Smart Girl Politics and she's with us as well. Now, I don't know if you've got programs, they uh, came a little late, but you'll see, if you do see the programs, that the motto of the caucus is embracing autonomy and encouraging unity. And there's a reason for that. For those of you who have only heard rumors about what the Tea Party stands for, I can tell you we are all very, very different, and we are all fiercely independent. But we all believe in liberty government. And that is one of the things that binds us together. The New Jersey Tea Party Caucus honors the independence and autonomy of each of its members. However, we do also recognize that if the Tea Party is to be successful in liberty government, that there are times when it would be wise to unite, and that's why we have formed this organization. Well, in addition to preserving limited government, we're also fighting to preserve our future through education reform. And uh, I'm sure most of you know that we do have three branches of government that are supposed to check and balance each other. At least when they're working correctly, they should. But there is another power that comes into play that we scarcely recognize, and that is the power of we the people and it is supposed to balance the entirety of government. And today we have gathered together to exercise the balancing of the power of we the people. And by doing that, we hope we can redeem what we have lost through those evil twins of apathy and complacency. We have learned the hard way that government will not check the balance itself. And unless we, the people, are diligent and demand that government remain our servant and not our master, that just is not going to happen. And nowhere is the repercussion of government intrusion more evident than in the field of education. As government mandates and core curricular standards have escalated, we have seen costs increase and academic, academic achievement decrease. If we truly want government to take a back seat in our lives, then we the people must step up to the plate. A diligent citizenry in a free republic must rely on its own initiatives and talents to solve its problems, or we will be forever shackled by an ever-growing and influential government. Government cannot remain limited if its citizens rely on it to solve its problems. And that is why we gather here today. Now, I can tell you that this particular group of patriots are exceptional. I've had the honor of working with many of them. And they are dedicated, and they are committed, and they do what they volunteer, and they say they will do. And that is pretty extraordinary in these times. So, you can find out more about us on our website, and that's very simply NJ Tea Parties, 
uh, njtpartycaucus.com, and we hope you'll go there, and you'll find that we do have three objectives. This is one of them, education reform. The other one is judicial reform, and then the other is defeating Agenda 21. So, I just want to tell you that we're going to have some panel discussion here, and then we're going to have a question and answer period, and afterwards we will be able to have a small meet and greet in the uh, outer room there. Uh, where you can meet Mr. Baden and some of the panelists. So I thank you all for coming, and now I want to uh, introduce some of the people on the panel. And they are a distinguished group. First, we'll start with Bob Baden. And Bob Baden is the creator of the infamous ex education expose, The Cartel, and founder of Choice Media, Dot TV, and he is our guest of honor. He will be presenting the latest videos, clips on education, and he will be moderating our panel discussion. Now, we also have Dr. William Maloney at the end there, I believe. Dr. Maloney, if you raise your hand, and he hails from Colorado. He came here to join us, and we are very honored that he did. He's former Colorado Commissioner of Education, who served for 30 years, over 30 years as a teacher, assistant principal, uh, principal, headmaster, assistant superintendent, and superintendent in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. Wow. As well as four years as director of the American School in London. He also served on the National Assess Assessment Governing Board and the National Council on Teacher Quality. Dr. Maloney holds a doctorate in education management earned at Harvard. And then we have Chris Kniesler. Chris, would you raise your hand, please? Chris is former director of uh, governmental relations for the New Jersey School Board Association. And in that capacity, he advocated for charter schools and evaluated numerous school choice initiatives. He is currently the executive director for Solutions for New Jersey, where he has written several op-ed pieces supporting school choice. And um, is Dan, I don't see Dan Haggerty. I'm here. Oh, there we are. I'm sorry, Dan, I didn't see you when I came in. Dan Haggerty, a New Jersey political activist and member of the New Jersey School Choice and Education Reform Alliance. He has been involved in school choice issues for almost 19 years, beginning in California on Proposition 174 with the Excellence Through, uh, through Choice in Education League. Dan co-hosts uh, a weekly radio show in the Philadelphia, South Jersey area called the Bear Haggerty Offensive, and de which deals with cultural and political matters. He writes for web publications such as American Thinker, Campus Tea Parties, Org, and others. And of course, we have one of my good friends and former co-host in r and &R, where we co-hosted together, Senator Dick LaRosa, is a former state senator. Okay, Dick is also uh, the president of Solutions for New Jersey. He's also our co-chair of um, our Judiciary Reform Committee, and as I said, he's done much television and also radio work. And he, one of the reasons why Dick is here today is because he actually, when he was in the state senate, authored the New Jersey charter school legislation. And we have our friend Rosalie Anetti, who is here, and she is, we introduced before, she's the state representative for Smart Girl Politics, she's on our panel. She is uh, our chairman of our Education Reform Committee, and she's also a New York City school teacher. So she'll have some interesting things to tell us about. And we have Philip Kilgore. Philip, would you raise your hand, please? And Philip Kilgore has also traveled quite a bit to be here with us today. He's the director of Charter School Initiative at Hillsdale College. The Barney uh, Charter School Initiative is a new project of Hillsdale College devoted to the education of young Americans. And through this initiative, the college will support and launch um, K through 12 charter schools which will be based on a classical liberal arts model and have a strong civil, uh, civics component. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Terrence O'Moore. Okay. 
and who teaches upper-level upper courses in Western and American heritage history at Hillsdale College. And Dr. Moore has traveled quite a ways to be with us this afternoon. He has also served as a lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1990 through 1993. And he was also the president of Ridgeview Classical Schools, a K through 12 charter school in Fort Collins, Colorado, which was twice ranked the number one public high school in the state. Now, with all that out of the way, I'd like to once again introduce you to our moderator and our distinguished guest, Mr. Bob Bowden. Everybody, I want to thank everyone for coming, and uh, in particular, well, all the organizers, Roseanne, Al, Dick, um, Michelle, everyone here. Um, I think it's going to be a great discussion, and I'm, I'm pleased to see such a great panel assembled. A couple of minutes about me, first of all. So it hasn't been called infamous before, at least <laughs> in a room uh, full of supporters. Maybe the NJEA would consider it infamous. But uh, I started this uh, trek by doing a documentary film called The Cartel about corruption in public education. And I used New Jersey as a, a case study for that. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I get the same comment, which is that uh, someone emails me from Iowa, like from last week, and say, we have it really bad here. It's just all the same issues. Not as bad as New Jersey, but it's all the same issues we have here in Iowa. It's not that bad, but it's really bad. So uh, anyway, uh, the, I, I thought by calling the film The Cartel, I would dispel any notion that I was hiding any uh, a possible um, political orientation or point of view uh, when some documentarians are uh, considered that form of art to supposedly be fly on the wall and uh, without any advocacy position. And so uh, I, <laughs> I thought that the name cartel would, uh, would get us past that. Um, so I did the film. It, uh, it turns out it, it, it basically just took off. Uh, it, we ended up winning 12 film festival awards, a national theatrical release in 2010, distribution from Warner Brothers, which is for independent film practically a miracle. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if you go to a film festival, you can see how many films are produced, and so uh, it's, it's rare to get distribution. We were uh, grateful for that. Um, which then led me to the next step. People around the country and everyone were asking me, you know, what's your next film going to be? Assuming a typical documentary model where I move to another topic, I'd go do uh, the drug war next or immigration next. But there was no subject that really called to me to my education did. So my next phase is to create Choice Media, which is an education reform news service homepage, as we call it. Everything from opinion columns, this is updated every day, uh, opinion columns on the right, news stories on the left, original video documentary uh, pieces uh, on the website uh, all the time. And that's basically my day job now, is producing uh, Choice Media TV and also going around and advocating for education reform. Uh, so that's how I got here. Um, I wanted to, I guess, begin uh, the discussion of education reform uh, by having the panelists talk for an introductory five minutes and having each of the panelists just say whatever you'd like to say regarding your view of where this movement is at, if you'd like to speak uh, nationally, if you have more uh, of a local uh, information you'd like to impart, whatever you'd like to say, uh, the five minutes of yours. Do we have like a, a way to flag them if they go too long? Uh, Roseanne, do you have like a, can you wave or something? You have something to do? All right, so try not to go too long. Uh, but um, and if it's okay with everyone, I'll just use first names so I don't get too confused <laughs> with everyone. Um, so uh, we'll start first with uh, Chris Knesler, but uh, I'll just use first names. Chris, go ahead. Chris. Well, it's great to be here, and I'm glad I'm first because uh, the good center next to me doesn't understand what five minutes means. <laughs> Um, the school choice is something I've been involved with for a long time, since I was, was with School Boards Association. Uh, and I've looked at a number of programs around the country and seen the success, and I've also witnessed firsthand the resistance that we get by our representatives in the state legislature to any type of initiative. And uh, I brought a prop with me, and this, is, and this will stop really the biggest problem that we have in New Jersey, and it dovetails very much with the cartel. What I have here are the ELEC reports from the NJEA PAC for this past election cycle. 
and there are almost $700,000 spent on campaigns. Of that, one Republican received a donation. One. And he was in his very safe district, and he was new, and they're probably trying to document him. But that's where our problem lies. We have, we're, we have no shortage of ideas in this state. I mean, the Alliance for Children gave our governor an A rating for what he's trying to do in the area of education. The problem is the legislature is doing everything they can to stop him and because the, the, many legislators fear the NJEA more than they fear their own constituents, and that's just a, an added battle that we have to uh, overcome. But that doesn't mean we can't do it. So that's about five minutes, don't you think? Just to get us started. All right. Actually, since uh, Dick LaRosa was added at the end there, he wasn't on my list, but he's first in line. I'm going to go in line. So, Dick, go ahead. Pass the mic over. No, I don't. You don't need oh, to the mic. He's loud enough. I'm loud enough. That's what they tell me. Uh, interesting little sidebar to the idea of charter schools, and I'll tell you uh, a real quick story. When the uh, bill was up for discussion, uh, there was a fairly lengthy conversation going on about the teachers who perhaps wanted to participate in a charter school environment and with regard to tenure. And the representative from the NJEA was arguing about how long they should be allowed to maintain their status in the school that they left uh, should they go to a uh, charter school. And ordinarily it would be three years. Well, the discussion proceeded for approximately 45 minutes, at which point I broke protocol and asked the chairman, uh, Senator Mattel, Senator, I said, uh, I said, I said uh, ask a question, and it's by all means. And uh, Dee Carano, who at the time was the principal lobbyist for the NJDA, I said, Dee, I said, just a quick question. I said, um, when a, a person has tenure in a public school system, um, you know, what happens when they leave the public school system and they go to a new public school system? What happens to their tenure? And she said, well, they start all over again and they lose tenure entirely. That was the end of the discussion. Because the fact of the matter is they're trying to provide something to protect their individuals in one setting, which is totally contradictory to the other setting. And again, these are the kinds of things that the public generally is not aware of. That's number one. The second problem is, or probably the single biggest problem, in New Jersey, and Bob, well, I don't know if it's the same way nationwide, uh, we have got to get the courts out of education. They have no business being there. They screw it up more than you could ever possibly imagine. Uh, in fact, at one point in time, uh, there was a, uh, a, 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 a decision that was rendered by the New Jersey Supreme Court. And the opening statement in the decision was, and I'm quoting, the Constitution notwithstanding. There's your problem. They don't care about the Constitution. They don't really care about what it says. They don't care about the kids. So that's another issue. The third problem is as far as funding education, we keep hearing about a thorough and efficient education. If you read the Constitution of the state of New Jersey, it does not say a thorough and efficient education. It says a thorough and efficient system of education, which is an enormous difference. The problem is that we fund everything. For example, if you have a school in Burton County that has a brand new swimming pool that costs a quarter of a million dollars, according to the way the Supreme Court operates, you are now required to give or spend that additional $250,000 to each of 31 school districts across the entire state so that they can then be brought up to the same spending level not the same educational level. So for some reason, our Supreme Court wants to equate uh, an equality of spending with the equality of education that is not now, nor will it ever be, what the problem is in terms of education. There are a whole lot of issues that we will get involved in as we go through, but again, if I, if I could start all over tomorrow, the first thing I would do is have a constitutional amendment that prohibits the NJEA and the New Jersey Supreme Court from having any interference or input whatsoever as it relates to education in the state of New Jersey. <laughs> 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 
No, exactly, yes. Uh, moving on, Rosa Leonetti is, uh, I believe she's intelligent because she's here representing smart girl <laughs> politics. So, Rosa. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am a product of the public school system. I am born and raised in Brooklyn, and I have been uh, teaching in New York City for the past uh, 18 years. Well, I hesitate to say that because then I date myself. Um, but in any case, uh, it's been quite a ride as I've evolved from a um, ignorant, uh, just want to change the world, kind of come in and be a role model, Latina role model to the to my students, to one where I am now immersed in um, the Teacher Union Alliance and their obstacle towards school reform. And if you think that the unions are your friends when it comes to reform, you are mistaken. The other day I was perusing the newspaper um, and I came up with this little tidbit. This is my little exhibit A. Uh, lessons in lobbying. The UFT devotes 3.8 million to politics after 44% hike. Um, that tells you that my payment, my co-payment, my UFT dues are not being used for the things that I think should be used, but rather they're being used to influence and sway political uh, people in the um, fold to get favors. That's the reason that we have not advanced with our school reform in the past I don't know, 30 plus years. Um, you start speaking about Union Alliance and you become really uh, as a UFT person in New York City and then you come over to New Jersey um, and things just start to get a whole lot clearer. Um, when you walk into a suburban school and you notice that your child does not have the laptops and the smart boards that kids in Newark or Camden have, though they are getting um, our tax base, where I live, I'm paying about 12,000 12, plus. All our monies are being drained and going into the Abbott School District and surrounding district, Newark, Patterson, Camden, Irvington. Um, and I am all for school reform and all for these children having uh, what they need in order to succeed. But not at the expense of my dollar. Uh, and having my child shortchanged and having only one laptop in her school floating around while everyone else at $29,000 in Newark um, goes on and on. Um, it's just pervasive and uh, one more tidbit, uh, if you think the unions are all for um, performance-based evaluations and performance-based growth, you are mistaken. They are opposing any kind of uh, growth in this area in terms of having evaluation uh, tied into merit. So there's just, we can go on and on. Just just a little, uh, I'm not upset. I'm just li letting you know what's going on. Thanks. Next, Phil Kilgore of Hillsdale College. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Dr. Moore and I are very pleased to be here from Michigan. Uh, thank you for the weather, making us feel at home. <laughs> Hillsdale College's work in K-12 education reform centers on a charter school initiative. Through it, we find parents and citizens across the country who seek to found classical charter schools, and we support them primarily on the design and implementation of their academic program. We focus exclusively on classical schools. In this kind of education, the student carefully studies the liberal arts. It has been the educational tradition in the West for two and a half millennia. We have learned from the ancients and the great thinkers in our heritage what kind of education must be provided to a free and self-governing people in a republic so that they can flourish and the republic can survive. Make no mistake, a proper understanding of the liberal arts includes the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. But distinguishing this academic focus, however, is a rigor and an accompanying school culture, educational philosophy, and aim that are simply not sufficiently present in other schools today. The school culture is one of discipline, decorum, and studiousness accompanied by a demand for moral virtue among the students. The educational philosophy reflects what our Western forebears did, that objective standards of truth and beauty exist, and we must learn what they are and conform ourselves to the highest and timeless principles if we are to know and enjoy our unalienable rights, among them being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our country's founders knew this, 
So we also make a rigorous study of them, what they did and what they knew. So our aim, therefore, is to educate the young so they may rise to be wise and virtuous American citizens. Terrence uh, Gore, also Hillsdale. Hello, thank you for having us out here. Uh, I wanted to add to some of the things Mr. Kobo was saying. Uh, but the first thing I want to do is to dispel a myth that I think many people have when they talk about education in this country. Uh, even if you read the pages of the Wall Street Journal, you're led to believe that the only places that education is failing is in what we euphemistically, euphemistically call the inner city or urban districts. Um, that's not true. The public schools are failing everywhere. Even in some of the richest, most conservative uh, places in the country, even in places like Colorado Springs. And my thesis is, and I'm not including charter schools in this, but there is no such thing as a good public school out there. And to the extent that there are programs that are better than others, usually what they're better at doing is making your students uh, not very knowledgeable of the Constitution, not like their country very much, perhaps not even like their families very much, and they're certainly not going to do, try to do anything that would uphold rather than to take away from a person's individual religion. In other words, the schools, to the extent that they are good, are probably very left-leaning, uh, and there's a kind of propaganda that goes hand in hand with that. At any rate, and of course nobody is talking about what's going on in the rural communities of this town, uh, of this country. And so that, that's just something that goes under the, under the radar that no one wants to talk about. But I will tell you, uh, having been to several uh, small towns, living in a small town myself, there are plenty of people who are dissatisfied with that education as well. Why is that? Well, this would take a fairly long time to tell you the whole history of what's called progressive education in this country which goes all the way back to probably around the turn of the century, from the 19th to the 20th century. But if you want to read it in a very short capsule, the best thing that you can do is take out your copy of To Kill a Mockingbird, which you probably were assigned in school, and you probably think you've read. And take a look at chapter two, and read the whole thing. And then read the, about the first couple of paragraphs of chapter four. And you will find in a very succinct way uh, a description of the decline of public schools in this country and how it happened. And it's not explained why it was never stopped. I get that question a lot. Why didn't anybody do anything about it? It's because nobody opposed what was going on in the schools starting in as early as the 30s and 40s, but certainly in the 60s and 70s. And so sometimes older people will say, well, I had a pretty good public school education. And that's right, you probably did. But between your education and my education, and then what would be my children's education in public schools, things have declined dramatically. And there are three basic reasons for that. The first is that there is no curriculum. You may think that your, your students, uh, your students uh, in the high school, they have a curriculum of some sort. There is no curriculum. There are a set of standards, and you're told that they're supposed to apply this learning standard or that learning standard. But if you were to go to the curriculum director, of a particular school and say, what books are your students reading? That person couldn't tell you. If you were to ask that person, what's in those books? That person couldn't tell you because there is no curriculum. If you don't believe that, you should become acquainted with the works of uh, E.D. Hirsch, who has exposed this situation for the last 20 or 30 years. The second reason your students aren't learning anything, or students in public schools aren't learning anything, is because the teachers are not very good. Now, that's not to say that no teacher is any good. And usually anybody who goes through a public school has an experience of saying, well, there was that one teacher, and he was really hard. But everybody else was not very hard. That's the typical experience. The reason those teachers are not very good is because they have to go through a process that's called certification. And so they have to come out of the nation's edu education schools. What goes on in the nation's education schools is not education. It's a bunch of puffery uh, that's masking his education, and it's also learning how to uh, beat the system, how to be a union member, uh, how to be an advocate for the schools, and how to sympathize with children and figure out the nine million ways they can't learn rather than the two or three ways they can learn. And I will tell you that the number one issue right now in public education, and this is something that your, your state senators and assemblymen need to hear, is teacher certification. In New Jersey, even if you were to set up a charter school, you 
you could not hire uncertified teachers. That means even when you're trying to break away from the public school system, you will still have to hire the same type of teachers. There is no, pub, there is no school of education in this country that requires its future teachers to learn how to teach reading through phonics. Well, there's one exception, Hillsdale College. There is no school of education in this country that teaches its teachers how to teach grammar through traditional means of diagramming. There is no school of, teacher, school of education in this country that makes its teachers learn the Constitution or makes its teachers take a course on Shakespeare if they're going to be turning, teaching English. Therefore, the teachers who go into the schools do not know anything. Now, the third reason, in addition to there not being very good teachers and then also there being no curriculum, is basically school politics and the machine that is the bureaucracy. But since you probably know that and so many other people talk to those issues on this panel, I'll go ahead and let that pass. But I will tell you that school reform will only work insofar as we make the curriculum foremost and also insofar as we make it the number one agenda to get the right kind of teachers into a school. I'll, I'll leave just with one anecdote. I've, I've hired a lot of teachers, and I've not hired a lot of teachers in running a school. One time I got this call from somebody who supposedly had a master's degree in literacy from a local college and had seven years of teaching experience. And sometimes these people, when they want jobs, they're pretty pushy. And of course, I was not going to look at this person because I was looking for a very different kind of candidate. But at any rate, this person called me on the phone and said, hey, you know, I have seven years of teaching experience and I have a master's degree in literacy. I think I'd be a great teacher for your school. And I said, great. Well, let me ask you a question. How do you, how do you teach reading if you have a master's degree in literacy? She said, Oh, well, you know, I use a combination of, combination of approaches, some phonics, some, you know, whole language, a blended approach. I said, okay, very well. So you know at least some phonics. She said, yes. I said, tell me the sounds that the letter A makes. I got silence on the end of the phone. And then after a long pause, I heard, uh, well, uh, I guess uh, long A and short A. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but my kindergartners can tell me that the letter A makes at least four sounds, A, 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 and A. For example, the word father, we don't pronounce it fader, we don't pronounce it fathom. Now, if a master's degree in literacy does not have the understanding of, the, of just the letter A, how is this person going to teach your children how to read? I guarantee you that woman did get a job, and she's teaching somebody's children right now that is failing to teach them. Thanks. Next, Dan Hacker. Thank you, Bob. Well, that was a great little talk. <clears throat> you can trust the Marine to go right to the objective, right? <laughs> no waste, wasting any time. Go right to the objective and take it out. And he's exactly right. I want to talk from a little different perspective. My perspective is political activism. Uh, in 1992, I was living in California, and the concept of school vouchers and school choice first made its way into the national scene. Now back then, people had no idea what a voucher was. I mean, it, it was just a foreign language. And there were a lot of uh, advocacy on both sides of the issue. And I remember one morning listening to NPR radio, and they said, you know, this school choice initiative coming up could be very dangerous for democracy. And I'm thinking, well, why? They said, it could allow pagan schools. And I said, oh, you gotta be kidding me. This is what we have right now. So I practically threw the radio out the window. I've never listened to NPR since then, and I never will. <laughs> and I got on the phone and I called Sacramento and I said, who's sponsoring the School Choice Initiative? They said, Excellence and Choice Through Education League. I said, give me their phone number. I called them up and I said, what can I do to help? They said, well, we'll have you make some phone calls and call up voters. Well, after about a week of that, I said, listen, I can do better than this. I want to get up in front of people. I want to talk about this. I want to debate people. And that's what I did. I didn't have any background in education. I didn't have any background in, in politics or anything like that. But I had enough. I'd heard enough lies, enough crap. And I said, I'm going to do something. Uh, it reminded me of, uh, did you ever see Taxi Driver? Travis Bickle, he said, here was a guy who would not take it anymore. That's what I felt like. 
So I went out and with my wife Julie there, we went to various colleges, schools, civic organizations, and I debated people from the California Teachers Association. And what a wake up call that was. I mean, you talk about a, a thugocracy, that's how I'm gonna describe it. The California Teachers Association raised, in today's dollars, $48 million to defeat a school choice initiative. Now, this is in spite of the fact that many, many teachers and educational professionals are very much in favor of school choice. You know, you have to remember, with the failing school system we have now, there's two losers, there's two assets that are being wasted. We're wasting the lives of children. We're also wasting the professional careers of teachers. How many teachers have you heard about that have given up after a certain amount of time and gone into investment banking or, or whatever, sales? How many other teachers can't take the bureaucratic oversight and the, the limited viewpoints of uh, the education system and they just kind of settle into a mediocre profession? It, it, it's very difficult. So that's, that's my perspective. That's where I come from on this issue. And uh, I want to continue in the uh, political aspect of it by talking about the fact that there's nothing in our Constitution, either New Jersey or the US Constitution, that says we have to send our children to government schools. No one should use the term public schools anymore. It's a misnomer. It's not what they are. They are government schools. Now, when you start thinking that way, it changes your perspective. You start thinking, oh, government, Department of Motor Vehicles, Post Office, okay. Not the military, they get the job done for very little pay, and they die and, and bleed for it. But think about it, government schools, that's where our children are. And they're no longer about education, they're about social indoctrination. They're about creating a compliant class of workers and I don't want to use some other words that, that are offensive, but that's really what our school system has become. Thank you. Uh, Bill Maloney on the end I, has been introduced as the former commissioner of education for Colorado for 10 years, but it should also be pointed out he worked in education in New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, Colorado, and now the short list of states leading the reform movement nationally. Uh, Bill? Yes, uh, being from Massachusetts, uh, I can read uh, faster than I uh, speak, so I think this brief overview will more than honor your time limitation, uh, Paul. Uh, American education is in deep trouble. Long as spring board to opportunity has now become a dragging anchor that threatens our future. We must understand that public education is an entitlement, though historically we haven't thought of it that way. Furthermore, in terms of its size, scope, and metastasizing cost, it is both larger and more dangerous than the more frequently discussed entitlements of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Left unchecked on its current trajectory, American education will be cited by future historians as a central cause in the decline of American civilization. This thesis rests on three incontestable realities concerning which America has been in denial for decades. One, low performance of U.S. schools, too well known to argue about. Two, high costs of U.S. schools. All studies show U.S. at or near the top in spending. Three, abundant models of higher performance coupled with lower costs. We found in our country and across the world. If we to solve our problems, we must first understand what went wrong. Here are some of the questions that we need to answer. Why, between 1970 and 2008, when K-12 student population increased only 8%, did the number of teachers increase by 61% and total staff by 93%? What, between 1970 and 2010, call, caused inflation-adjusted K-12 spending to increase by 102%? How, when we already spent three of every five state and local dollars on education, can the education establishment claim to be grossly under? Fund. Why do educators have pension and health benefits twice that of the average citizen? How do other once elitist industrial nations now educate a higher proportion of 5 to 18 year olds than the United States and more successfully? How did Japan and some European nations do a better job for special education students at much lower cost? Why do impoverished 100% African descended nations in the Caribbean have higher literacy rates? than the United States? Why do all the nations get their teachers from the top 5 to 30% of their class, while U.S. teachers, on average, 
come from the bottom third of the class? How does a nation with rampant grade inflation, social promotion, debased high school diplomas, and de facto open admission to colleges claim to high standards? Why did Bill Gates establish a Microsoft research center in Beijing staffed by Chinese researchers while saying the most groundbreaking and innovative ideas were not focused in the United States anymore? How did these things happen? How did we lose our way? Serious mission confusion began when school would declare the ideal forum to resolve explosive issues of class, language, race, religion, and sexuality that society is unwilling or unable to deal with elsewhere. Inevitably, the quality of the educational product began to sag under the weight of the social missions and attendant confusion of purpose. From this point, we would see a steady erosion of public confidence and also a decline in achievement. In more stable settings, it would be possible to paper over the cracks in the edifice, but in less stable settings, Notably, our large urban systems, it was impossible to mask the descent into educational chaos marked by student disorders, confrontations among parent groups, labor disputes, battles over finance, and litigation on just about everything. During the same period, there seemed to be an increasing doubt among educators as to what to teach and how. Requirements fell and core curriculum diminished. How do we put our schools back together again? We don't. The traditional educational system is gone forever, and we should admit it. The real solution lies not in more tinkering with the increasing contradictions of the existing system, but rather in a radicalized reform that would fundamentally redesign our education system along more rational lines. The result would be a curriculum consensus similar to those in the rest of the world and schools pursuing reasonable missions at reasonable cost. It's not magic. Other countries do it. Why not the United States? Surely this can't be so easy to say. You're right. Hear that mooing in the background? That's education's herd of sacred cows whose thinking on reform starts and ends with a dollar sign and who would see our schools at ruin before sacrificing their vested interests on behalf of the national interest. As Pogo used to say, we have met the enemy and it is us. Can we turn all of this around? The commentator Charles Krauthammer reminds us that decline is a choice. So too is renaissance. Which door will America pass through? Winston Churchill famously said that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing, but only after they've tried every other thing. Well, <laughs> educationally, we've tried every other thing. It's now time to do the right thing. All right, so those were our opening statements. Just quickly, by the way, in case you're wondering, these are yellow scarves that are provided by National School Choice Week. This is a movement uh, that is the second annual week for National School Choice Week. Uh, yesterday I was in New Orleans for the kickoff of it, and it uh, officially starts today and goes the next six days after today. Uh, there are over 400 events lined up all around the country, so uh, if you guys have friends in other parts of the country that might be interested in participating, if they go to schoolchoiceweek.com, they can look up events, put in their zip code, and find a list near them not unlike this or all kinds of different events actually by the way and and i wanted to just point that out before you forward and there, there are free scarves outside by the way you guys know that you can get a free scarf so uh, you know all your friends can see this this logo um i guess before we move on <laughs> I, I, never mind before i move on i see that um uh, one of the things we want to do is have the panelists comment on some of the other things you've heard other panelists say and i'm sure you guys must have been making notes or thinking about uh, observations of your own as you've heard from other panelists. Who wants to jump in first with something that either surprised you or something you want to uh, further uh, corroborate? Who wants to talk about something they heard someone else say? We'll start with Dan. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, a doctor, professional in education. Microphone. Uh, say that the school system we have now is dead. That's, I think that's a very important point of awareness we all need to adopt. I would like to hear some nitty gritty about what goes on in public school in New Jersey. <laughs> Any anecdotes you would care to share? Yes, plenty of those. You came to the right place for that. Right place. Yeah. Uh, I uh, just uh, like the last comment, uh, sir, that you said about uh, uh, being able to perform from within. Essentially, is uh, a, a lost cause. It seems, and uh, radical reformation needs to occur from inside. I like Dr. Moore's comment on the decline of the teacher, the teacher profession. Um, how true that many of uh, my colleagues 
are not prepared to uh, teach. Um, and when you are a teacher who tries to excel and think outside of the box and leans towards that classic learning style, you are met with much resistance. So uh, kudos to you for bringing that to the forefront. Um, as many of the teachers would like to be more, a more, much more superior and prolific at their profession, but they are indeed surrounded by mediocrity. I think one of the most important things said today so far is that our public school system is broken. I mean, here in New Jersey, the studies are out that our students who enter our community colleges, over half of them have to take remedial English and math courses. I mean, that, that is a testament right there as to how poor our public school system are. The other thing is, my sister is vice president of an organization called Jobs for the Future. And the biggest complaint that they get from the corporations in New Jersey is the fact that we do not have a trained workforce coming out of our public school system. And that is a very, very sad statement. And I think that, you know, everybody here, we, like I said, we have the ideas. We just have to get them in action. Yeah, and I agree with Chris about getting the ideas in action. Uh, so many times we will get into a situation where uh, we'll go to the well and try to change things, and we'll go there 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times and get turned away and think that, well, it's never going to change. And what I keep telling people, if you go to that same well 100 times and the answer is still no, if you don't go back the 101st time, they win. You've got to keep going back over and over and over and not let them win, to let them know that you are not going away. And commenting on a couple of uh, other comments that the, the other panel has made, I thought you would find this interesting in terms of you know money, um, not including the cost of construction. Anybody want to take a wild guess how much money has been spent by the state of New Jersey in just 30 school districts over the last 20 years? 20 billion dollars on the average schools. 60% of the money goes to 22% of the students. And to follow up on the story about the, the letter A, uh, I, at one time after I left uh, teaching, uh, 